Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and our Duna mission is ready to go here. So we've got our launch window lined up, we've got a rocket fuel that's on the pad, we're going to pop out the resources, expand the map. But I think before I do the mission proper, I actually am going to show you a little trick here. Now, I just begin this launch regularly, just bank it over a little, and now I'm not going to touch the yaw, pitch, and roll controls, right? So if you look in the bottom uh, left corner, you have indicators for yaw, pitch, and roll. Now those fins are keeping this rocket nicely stable. What's happening is, of course, it's undergoing a gravity turn right now. But that's just the, you know, aerodynamics is kind of keeping it straight. The nose is getting pulled slowly down, or the whole trajectory is getting slowly pulled down. But as the rocket is burning fuel, the center of mass is changing. So what may seem like a perfectly stable rocket may suddenly go unstable like this. So what's happened there is the center of mass has moved backwards behind the center of drag and suddenly this rocket is no longer the straight, you know, flying arrow that it once was. This thing is you're know, pulling a nice loop-de-loop -loop above the launch site there. Now, this shifting center of mass is a real problem in real rockets, but you don't tend to see this kind of thing happening with a regular rocket. And the reason being that your fuel and your oxidizer aren't kind of mixed in the same tanks. You'll generally have one tank at the front containing either fuel or oxidizer, and then your the other, the counterpart, is contained in the rear tank. So the mass distribution doesn't change in quite the same way in one of these rockets. And if you look at, for example, the Space Shuttle's external tank, the liquid oxygen is at the front and the liquid hydrogen is at the back, which actually helps to keep the center of mass further forward. Okay, so this thing is doomed. Let's go and show you a trick to actually keep this stable through the entire launch. Okay, again, we're going to do the real launch, and I'm not going to touch the controls after I've initially started out. So we're going to know our map, we're go we've got our resources set up, we're going to go for an equatorial orbit, about 80 kilometers, and off we go. Little bit of a turn, but not much early on. And right away I hold ALT and right click on both tanks and start transferring fuel from the rear tank forwards. And in fact, I'm refilling that front tank faster than the fuel is being consumed. So the whole rocket is having the center of mass kept far enough forwards that it shouldn't become aerodynamically unstable. And I'm showing a lot of confidence here. Note there is no stability control, no SAS, no control inputs. I am entirely letting this thing fly. I'm, you know, according to the forces of gravity, aerodynamics, engines, right? I am not doing anything other than pumping fuel forwards. And look at it flying straight as an arrow into the upper atmosphere with its payload of scientific awesomeness. Now, uh, this tank is empty, so I'm just going to keep transferring the fuel just in case. It doesn't hurt. I, it may not be an issue, but it certainly doesn't hurt to have all this fuel mass pushed forwards all the time. So I think, actually, at some point, I'm going to have to check the map to make sure that I don't go into too high an orbit. And there we go here. 54 kilometers. So I'm going to... It looks like this is a really steep orbit. But hey, I didn't touch any controls. This was the only control input was from the first few seconds as we let the we initiated a small gravity turn and let it develop. Yeah, 45 degree turn or 45 degree pitch at 35 kilometers. That's um not the, the not the most shallow gravity turn. Certainly this is not going to win any points for efficiency, but we just know that we need to get that upper stage into orbit. So I'm going to, looks like I'm going to burn out of fuel in this main stage before, or after I get to orbit, so I may as well ditch the fairing once I get above uh, 70 kilometers, just so that I'm not carrying as much mass into into orbit. 87 kilometers, looking good. Now I'm just going to get out of the atmosphere before I set up a maneuver node for orbit. The reason is that when you're inside the atmosphere, the atmosphere is slowing you down, and that means your maneuver node is potentially changing. Anyway, once we get above 70 kilometers, we're going to ditch that fairing. And there we go. We are free of the, I don't know, the confines of, of the atmosphere or whatever. 
Its effect is no longer slowing us down and we can set up this maneuver node and hopefully it will uh, hopefully it won't change too much by the time it gets to us. The maneuvers, the further out a maneuver is, right, the more chance that random motions in your spacecraft will mess them up, mess the thing up a little. So I'm just gonna turn that that way. 83. Yes, that's pretty good. Okay. Just line this thing up here. Of course, this probe does not have the, the SAS ability to follow the maneuver node, but that's fine. It's going to be a 35 second burn, and we're about th uh, 25 seconds away, so get ready to light up this candle for the final time. I, if, if possible, I will leave this major stage, or this first stage, on an orbit which intersects the atmosphere, so that it will return to the planet and be, you know, let it get recycled or whatever. Or become a beautiful light show to people standing underneath it. Obviously not directly underneath it, because if they were directly underneath it, they would be running for their lives from pieces of flaming wreckage. Okay, there we go. And... That's us just there. And... So just finishing. Oh, and I think I actually ran out of fuel. That was rather beautiful. It's in a 17 kilometer orbit. I tell you, that may have been a terribly inefficient launch, but it turns out that it burnt exactly the right amount of fuel for us. Okay. Activate this engine and complete the orbital insertion. There you go. Camera turning is the message to say that we have in fact achieved something approximating orbit. Okay. So now we can prepare for the journey ahead. First of all, we're going to quick save, and then we can deploy those solar panels. Now, remember I used to right click and just deploy them, but I have action groups, so I just turn on the lights. And look, the lights have in fact deployed the solar panels. It's, it's just imagine that you have your control panel and there's this button that's used for the lights and in, instead you assign it to something else. And if we need any instruments on the rover, we can open up the doors to use them. Anyway, we have to begin our transfer to Duna. We have put it roughly 45 degrees ahead of us in the orbit. We have to target it. And, uh, yeah, the clicks aren't responding. Okay, time for a quick reload. Okay, so let's take a look and see if we actually have... We have, um, navigation. Is the navigation online? Set as target. Brilliant! That is us. Okay, so we want to go faster and faster in our orbit. So if we're going outwards, we create a maneuver node on the dark side of Kerbin. And that means that when we come out, uh, we will be going faster than Kerbin. We will escape and we will transfer into an orbit which brings us further from the sun. You see that? That's pretty darn good actually already. Now if you're going inwards you want to do the burn on the daytime side of the planet. That's the, the real rule here. If you're going to go outwards you do it on the dark side. If you're going to go inwards you do it on the light side. Now you see I've actually got a close approach there. So I'm going to try dragging this thing. Oh wow it doesn't seem to be responding particularly well here. So when it's doing that, that is indicating that the physics of the object is, is uh, interacting. There could be something weird going on with colliders or something. The reliable way to fix that is to put on time acceleration. Just at like times five, it just has to take it out of physics mode. Then all the vehicle interactions don't work. There, look at that. So what all I was doing there Right, was dragging the orbit, uh, the beat, the time of the maneuver back and forth, and all that was doing was adjusting the angle at which I departed Kerbin. So by doing that, we managed to get a pretty close encounter with Duna here. Now, if you, there are other videos of mine where I go into this whole process in a whole lot more detail, and truthfully, it is a rather, it is a whole lot of trial and error. The main thing is you want to shoot. Whoa, what the heck was that? Basic fin collided into service bay. I think I know what was causing that wobble in the orbit there. <laughs> Apparently my fins are interact- Oh my god, my fins are like- What the heck? They're just like hanging off there, like weird hanging off a type thing. 
It's like, wh what the heck? <laughs> oh, wow. Where are you going? Oh, oh, wait, do not fall apart. Okay, time acceleration enabled. I, uh, I think the colliders on those doors are not doing any favors for me. <laughs> Oh, and another thing about the map I should show you is up the top you should be able to select... No, oh, you're supposed to be able to select and deselect which classes of objects are shown in the map. But for some reason, it's not responding. It could be a bad interaction with a mod or something. And I only have the one mod, so God knows what's going on there. There is the remains of my spacecraft or the booster deorbiting below me. Ooh, look at that. Isn't that rather beautiful sunset over Kerbin? Unfortunately, because I had to reload to get the Duna encounter working, I have no idea what my estimated burn time will be, but I will presume that I'm getting at least 1G from this and therefore will need a burn of about uh, 110 seconds. So let's, let's start about 50 seconds out and see what it says. One minute for seven... Okay, so yeah, we're getting more than... More than a 1G there. Burn it down till it's about 35, 36. Go! Start burning. When you are departing to go to escape velocity, you want to be going... You want to be accelerating as hard as possible, basically. So, the way this works is you are inside the sphere of influence of Kerbin, and you're wanting to accelerate up to escape velocity and come out with sufficient speed that your resulting orbit travels all the way out to Duna's orbit. And also, you want to make sure that when you get there, Duna is also there. This is a really hard set of uh, maneuver requirements or whatever to get simultane happening simultaneously. There are a few mods that will actually help you do this, but generally, I would just suggest learning how the system works. If your maneuver node, if you're getting up to Duna and it's either ahead of you or behind you, you can drag the the maneuver around the orbit so that you adjust your departure angle. That works pretty well. Okay, let's see how close we actually are. We've done that. Come out, come out, come out. And oh, wow, we got an encounter. 42,000. That is pretty close. Now, you'll notice that the maneuver, uh, the orbital projection just stops when we reach Duna. The reason is that we have three different sections of orbit displayed. So we have the section as we leave Kerbin, we have one where we're transferring to Duna, and then we have a little one as we arrive at Duna. Anyway, take this moment as you depart to observe Kerbin leaving behind you. It is a rather beautiful experience, and it's a rather um, enjoyable to see the Kerbal's home planet diminishing into the distance. As you fly off to infinity and beyond. Oh, there's the moon popping out for a second before disappearing back behind it. We are on what's called a hyperbolic trajectory, by the way. Normal orbits are ellipses, right? Ellipsoids. So this is a hyperbol, hyperboloid, hyperbola. Okay. So next... You see how we now have a blue orbit and a purple orbit? So the purple orbit is what my orbit will be after I've encountered Duna. But now we have become the first spacecraft to reach interplanetary space, therefore quick save. And now we're going to do some science. Now of course I've got all these materials bays and stuff, but I'm only going to do repeatable science. So temperature scan in a high above the sun, right? So that's what it qualifies as. We are now orbiting the sun rather than a planet. We're going to do pressure data and we're going to send that back to base. Is there anything else that we have? We have a seismometer which is, well, essentially useless in deep space. And now I think about it, I wish I'd packed some extra uh, goo experiments because the goo experiments are kind of nice, but I would really like to run one of these in deep, deep space. So, if you think about it, at, at a Duna, we're going to get high and low, and we also have Ike, where we can get high and low goo experiments. I'm going to have to burn one of my goo experiments, basically, if I'm going to get interplanetary, above-the-sun science data. The goo feels right at home here, and we get some science. We transmit it home. 
Yes, this thing isn't going to be coming back to Kerbin. That is, if you want to build one that comes back to Kerbin, well, uh, you're going to have to figure that out. Okay, so we're going to make a further correction to the orbit here. We want to make our orbit uh, encounter Duna a little more closely than 42,000 kilometers. Now, you'll notice there that what I'm trying to do here is I want to select the blue orbit. The purple orbit is right next to it. If you select the purple orbit, that will just modify your post-encounter orbit rather than your pre-encounter orbit, right? If you modify your orbit after you've encountered Duna, it's not going to help you get any closer. So there we go. We picked this up. And if I focus on Duna, I can actually go in and see where the orbit is. See that? It's passing off on that side. Now, if I drag this down, you see that the two orbits have gone slightly different directions, right? You see that? We have two different orbits here now because the maneuver node has adjusted one of them. And by changing my position by, or my velocity by half a meter per second, we've moved the target orbit by hundreds of kilometers. So I'm just going to try and get it much closer to Duna. The closer you get it to Duna, the less fuel it's going to take to slow down. This is true of any planetary voyage. And, it, and, you know, Duna has an atmosphere and you can use it for aero braking. But even if the planet or moon doesn't have an atmosphere, the closer you perform your capture burn, the less fuel overall it's going to need, generally. I mean, there's there's some strange uh, there's some strange mathematics that goes on there, but trust me on this. Being close and accurate is good. Okay, so you see how I can move the orbit up and down. What you're going to do here is you're going to try the different directions. And there, that's getting two thousand kilometers from Duna now. I'm just going to get a little closer. Oh, and now what's happening is I'm getting an encounter with Ike. Ike is one of Duna's, or it is Duna's moon, and it is actually one of the biggest moons compared to its parent planet. Uh, it, if you're traveling to Duna in the, in the equatorial plane, odds are, pr the odds are pretty good that you will get an encounter with, Dun with Ike. And, uh, of course, in this case, it will represent bonus science. But if you're trying to get a close encounter with Ike, then it can really make, mean some complications in your orbit because it will deflect your orbit by quite a lot. But I think, actually, we're doing fine here. Unfortunately, I can't tell what my post-Ike encounter distance is because you only get three... You only get three orbit sections, so we've got the transfer to Duna in the sun, we've got orbiting around Duna heading towards Ike, and then we're passing through Ike, and then beyond that we don't have any predictions. So for all I know, after encountering Ike, I could smash into the planet Duna, right? <laughs> we will find out once we actually get into Duna's sphere of influence, because then we'll lose one of the predictions. One of the, the orbits will no longer be needed, so we can plot the orbit one more step further out. And we have to make this burn. Now, interesting thing about maneuver nodes, the, the further you are away in time from your destination, right, the less important it is to get your maneuver node happening at exactly the right time, but the more important it is to get the maneuver node happening with the exact velocity. So the velocity importance gets, uh, getting your velocity accurate gets much more important as you're further from your destination, whereas the time at which the burn is made gets less important as you're further from your destination. So sometimes it's it's okay to set up a maneuver node and then perform the burn even though it's hours away. So I'm just gonna get this point there, zero, zero, excellent. Setting us up for an excellent encounter with Duna and a possible future episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.